Hello and welcome back to Budget Eats, this time food pantry edition, sort of. So quite a few of you have been pitching a food pantry edition of Budget Eats all the way back to last year, but I've been hesitant to do it. One, because I'm obviously not a food insecure household, and two, because food pantry box contents can vary widely from location to location. But back in February of this year, Courtney from Foodshare South Carolina reached out to me via email asking me if I would consider putting one of their $15 produce boxes into a future episode of Budget Eats. And here we are. Foodshare's mission is to deliver fresh produce to people who need it no matter where they live, no matter who they are. And Courtney explained to me that what Foodshare does goes hand in hand with what Budget Eats does. Stats from 2018 say that one in nine Americans are food insecure. The math works out to be about 37 to 40 million Americans who don't have guaranteed nutritious meals on their table, 11 million of which are children. Sadly enough, this is a figure that has been largely unchanged from the time when I researched SNAP benefits, formerly known as food stamps, all the way back in high school over 10 years ago. As long as systemic inequities exist, and they will, food insecurity will always be an issue. But we have to look on the bright side of things in this dark hellhole that we live in sometimes, and that's why I'm thankful and happy that programs like Foodshare in South Carolina exist. In the description box below, we'll give you a list of resources and information compiled by the folks at Foodshare South Carolina, as well as the folks at Hunger Free America here in New York City. Thanks for coming to my TED Talk. Now let's get into this box. Courtney sent me a couple of food share boxes so that we're not shipping produce across state lines, and I went to my local farmer's market to purchase what usually comes in one of these boxes. While I was shopping there, I found out that there's a Health Bucks program that gives you up to $10 back in tokens if you spend $10 of your EBT benefits there which means if you're a SNAP recipient, you spend 10 and you get 10, which is a really nifty deal. It's not unlike how Foodshare's $15 box is only $5 for EBT holders. Fred, isn't that a good deal? Isn't that such a good deal? To mock up my Foodshare box, I got a bunch of bananas, a pint of blueberries, one green cabbage, one head of celery, three years corn, two cucumbers, one mango, a bunch of green onions, three peaches, two yellow squash, as well as three tomatoes. Now I spent $22.98 total on all of these things, but if you were to buy it from South Carolina's food share, you would get them for 15 total. You'd also get these really nifty recipe cards that come with the box as well. Courtney explained that these boxes are not meant to be used on their own, but rather to supplement other food sources that families may get, like for example, boxes from a food pantry or farmers to families boxes. And because I wasn't about to take up a box from an actual food pantry, I went to my very own food pantry, AKA the Delish Test Kitchen. After over a year of working at home, I was so excited to see all the goodies in there frozen in time. I polled y'all on our community page to get some insight on what you usually get from a food pantry box, and man oh man, did y'all show up for that with answers. Thank you so much for participating and letting me know what your food pantry boxes look like. And so for my very own food mock-up box, I got one loaf of frozen hala that's been in there for way too long, one jar of peanut butter that has been expired, as well as a jar of strawberry jam, probably also expired, a can of evaporated milk, a can of beef gravy, a can of tomato soup, a can of black olives. Are they all expired? Maybe we can just stop checking right now. If your cans aren't bulging or rusty, chances are you'll be fine. If you open it up and there's no mysterious wisp of gas escaping, you're probably also fine. But again, I'm no food scientist, so eat at your own risk. Continuing along our canned collection, we have a can of chipotle peppers, a can of pineapple chunks, we have a pound of pasta from two open boxes slash bags, we have a box of cornflakes, also opened, also probably expired. I found three seasoning packets, one box mac and cheese, one box of Ritz crackers, 
a pound of dried pinto beans, and I also found this half block of Spam that's been frozen in my freezer for way too long that we are gonna use this time around. Very promising haul. <laughs> All right, let's lay down the ground rules for this episode because this is gonna be a very different episode. Rule one, even though it's just me and Fred in the house at the time, I will be making enough for two people each meal. The produce box that Courtney sent is enough for a household of two to three, so we're just gonna see how long we can stretch it. Rule number two, unlike previous editions of Budget Eats, this episode I will not be making use of my pantry spices, oils, condiments. I'll keep to these leftover packets that I've racked up over the years and one McCormick black pepper that just refuses to die. For the rest of our seasonings, I will be relying on whatever we got in our boxes. Courtney also mentioned that at Food Share, they often encounter households that have only one hot plate, single burner in mobile homes with no ovens. So this week, especially with the summer heat kicking in, I will only be using one burner on my stovetop along with my microwave and no fancy appliances. That's right, we're gonna give our Vitamix a rest he thanks you all. Nicole from Hunger Free America also asked me to consider the time constraints that a lot of families face. Some folks have to work multiple jobs with super long hours and when they come home, they just wanna eat. So for rule number four, we are gonna try to kiss. Keep it simple, stupid. That fantastic acronym comes to you by way of my global history teacher in the 10th grade. All right, y'all, you ready for this? I'm not really ready, but I will lie to you and say that I am. First things first, let's prep some items. Whenever I get bananas, I like to tear open the bag and rinse off all the bananas to eliminate fruit flies from happening. Doesn't work 100% of the time, but it works nine out of 10 times. And a word to you folks who compost, please remove these stickers off of your produce before you compost. They are not meant to go into that pile. Second thing I'd like to prep is our beans. We need to soak them if we are to eat them. We're just gonna rinse them really fast and then let them soak overnight. Third prep I'd like to do is to rinse off and clean all of our celery and green onions. Because these are ginormous, I'm gonna cut them into sections and I'm gonna make sure every single inch is being rinsed clean because farmer's market produce, they can be quite gritty. You forget sometimes where your food comes from. If you ever see grit trapped in between the celery and you can't really wash it out, cut it in half and then rinse completely. You really don't want any crunchy grittiness in your bite. After everyone's been washed and shaken dry, I like to wrap them in a paper towel and slide them into a resealable bag. Kept this way, it should be good until the end of the week. As for the celery leaves, we're gonna keep them separate, wash them completely, dry them completely, and I'm thinking we can use these as herbs. Celery leaves can be a little bit bitter, almost like licorice-y and anise-like, but they're very flavorful, very herbaceous, and we can definitely use them like how we would use parsley. For the green onions, we're also going to chop them into sections and rinse them really well. If you see grit inside that little tube of green scallions, you gotta rinse it out, otherwise it will get very crunchy and not in a good way. Afterwards, also gonna store them in a resealable container sandwiched between some paper towels. By the way, did I mention you can definitely repot your scallion root ends for more scallions? I like to trim about an inch above that root end and then just pot it in some wet, rich soil, cover it back up, and you shall have scallions. The next thing I wanna prep is to get this peanut oil out of that peanut jar. Because we won't be using any other additional sources of oil, this is gonna be a very precious item for me to have. As for this peanut butter that expired a year ago, does it smell a little funny? Yeah, it smells a little off. Am I still gonna use it? Who do you think you're talking to here? We shall have to use all three tablespoons of it sparingly. And finally, the last thing that I wanna prep today is corn. I'm going to strip out the outermost leaves. We're gonna rinse it clean. We're gonna trim off the browning silk and then we're going to take the kernels off the cob. I will be reserving the inner leaves for something. Don't know what yet, but I'm sure it'll come to me. The internet tells me that there is a strand of corn silk for every kernel of corn found on your cob. I don't know if that's true, but I do know that most people throw this out without ever using it. Tastes like grass. Sweet juicy, crunchy 
refreshing grass. We're definitely gonna save that baby. To get my kernels of corn off the cob, I take a really sharp knife, I put a cutting board fitted over a baking sheet to catch all of the kernels, and then I just slice top down. Keep your grip firm on the cob and rotate as you go. Raw corn can be a little bit starchier than cooked corn, but it's just that sweet and it can be extra juicy. Corn prep complete. Now, as far as our meal goes, this tomato is already starting to go a little bad, so I think I wanna go ahead and use this up. But what do we wanna make? Because we do have bread this time around, the first thought that came to mind was a BLT. But obviously we don't have bacon or lettuce, although we do have cabbage. And we also have this corn silk, which reminds me of microgreens. They're tiny, they're sprouty, they're crisp. We also have a lot of green onions. So what I think I'm gonna do is chop some of these up along with our corn silk and use those as lettuces. As for our bacon, how about our good old peanut butter? Is there mayo in a BLT? BLT recipe delish. Wow, okay, our BLT sandwich has a lot going on, guys. There's maple syrup, brown sugar, cayenne, paprika, chili powder, mayonnaise, all of which we could do if I could use my pantry, but I can't. But I do have some of these packets, one of which is mayo. I'm gonna have to use these real sparingly. We're gonna slice our bread up. We'll toast it in a cast iron skillet over medium-ish heat until it's nicely golden brown on both sides, and then we'll slather it. Thin layer of mayo, thin layer of peanut butter, thin slices of tomato, topped with our chopped corn silk and green onions. Tomato, corn silk, green onions, peanut butter, mayo on challah bread. Hmm, I'm intrigued. Oh my. The sweetness from the hala combines with the sweet tartness of the tomato, the nice fragrance of that corn silk. The juiciness of the tomato cuts right through that sticky, thick peanut butter. This works. The green onions not only add a really nice crunch, but also fresh spiciness. I think because we use so little mayo, I can't really taste it, but it folds really nicely into that butteriness of the challah to begin with. Mm-hmm. Man, oh man, that corn silk though. It's actually really delicious. Maybe it's just because there's peanut butter in here, but I love it. Do we think Fred's gonna like it? We're not actually feeding him, guys. Simon meow. Can you tell me? Do you like it? Do you want it? Are you interested? That's a maybe. You can't have it, I'm sorry. It's really tough to be you, huh, Fred? Yeah, I know, bud. I'm gonna eat it for you though, okay? That's good enough, right? Considering the fact that this sandwich is pretty much vegetarian and Fred was even interested in it means that it's actually quite good, guys, because he's not interested in the vegetarian stuff. Simon Meow has spoken. I'm gonna give this sandwich an 8.3. It is peanut buttery, it is comforting, it is nicely flavored, textured, and just really easy to throw together. Next up, Easy Mac. This box has a Best Buy date of October 2019, but seeing how everything is dehydrated in here, I think we're fine. Now obviously, I'm not going to use this on its own. This, this is gonna come in handy but not right now. I never grew up with Easy Mac and the first time I had it was in college and boy oh boy, were these pasta noodles really disappointing. I'm not sure who engineered this shape, but they are skinny, like little bucatini chopped up into pieces and they are so easily overcooked. The water gushes into these skinny little tunnels, cooks them from the inside out, and then cooks from the outside in from the surrounding water, and it is so easily mushed. Although I am a fan of mush food, pasta just isn't one of those things that should be mush. I'm gonna use these noodles in a pasta salad. Because there isn't a lot of pasta, we're gonna go with a small pot, and we're gonna go with just enough water to cover by half an inch. We're going to cook, stirring occasionally until it's al dente, and then we're gonna drain and reserve all the pasta water. The good starchiness here should not be wasted. And yes, I am starting this pasta in cold water. 
It still cooks, guys. Just about a minute after the water comes up to a boil, the noodles are past al dente. They cook so fast. Look at this box of lies. Start your Easy Mac in cold water. Do not cook for more than two minutes. Drain and shake immediately. You're welcome. I know I changed your life so much. To really add some heft to this pasta salad, we're gonna go heavy on the veggies. Crunchy celery. <laughs> half a juicy tomato. I'm keeping the tomatoes here in big chunks so that they have more of a meaty bite to them. Nice briny olives, whose juice we're gonna pour out into a jar and save for later. Zesty green onions, sweet creamy-like corn, and some delightfully salty Spam. And we're gonna toss it in a bowl with our salad in a sauce. What's the sauce? a trash sauce. We're gonna take some ketchup, some mayo, some mustard, and combine it along with some chopped chipotle pepper and adobo sauce, as well as a little bit of our black olive juice. Stir your sauce until it's all nice and smooth and drizzleable, and then pour it into your pasta mixture and give it a nice good toss. This honestly already looks and smells pretty great, but I think you can always make something better by making it a little bit of a crunchy garnish. Enter Ritz crackers that expired in July of last year and some ranch powder seasoning. What I'm gonna do is crush up some of our Ritz, toss it with some of our ranch seasoning powder and make a little ranchy crackery topping for our pasta salad. Oh my God, that smells good. How much you wanna bet there's MSG in here? Maltodextrin, buttermilk, salt, monosodium glutamate. That's why it tastes so hecking good. <laughs> Smells mayo-y, mustardy, ketchup-y, kind of like a special sauce on a hamburger. Not gonna lie, it's a lot to take on in a single bite. The crunch and juice of anise flavor from the celery combining with that briny black olive flavor, strange. But then the silky noodles kick in, crunch right through the crushed Ritz crackers with that little MSG sprinkle on top. It's pretty good, guys. Every bite, you get a little something different. It tastes like summer. Tastes like a hot dog with a relish on top. I think I probably could have left out the chunks of black olive in here. It doesn't seem to quite fit, but everything else is a fantastically clean tasting summer cookout salad. Do we think Fred's gonna like it? What do you think, bud? Do you wanna smell it? Intrigued, but not sure what it is. Oh, you smell the spam, don't you? Wow, you're interested. How's your day, Fred? Were you productive today, bud? I think based on Fred's reaction, it was intriguing, but not really that good, which I think I have to agree with. Would I eat it again? Obviously, I made way too much. Do I regret making it? Absolutely not. In fact, I think the more I eat it, the more I like it. And how can you not when you have ranch powder Ritz on top? As is, I'm gonna give this one a 7.1. So about these corn cobs, I think the very last thing I'm gonna do today is to boil them in some water and make some corn cob stock. In the summer, whenever my mom would boil corn on the cob for me, she would always boil the water and make me drink it. And that water is actually really sweet and really flavorful. So I thought we have the cobs. It still has some nice sugary starches on there. Why not suck it dry, just like a bone broth, but vegetarian. I'm also gonna slip a couple of these leaves in just for extra flavor. Once it comes up to a boil, we'll just let it simmer for a couple of hours, however long we can afford to. The longer, the better, more flavor with time. Aaron just got home, I wonder if he wants to eat. Aaron, do you want some food? Yes, June, I do want some food. <laughs> that was totally not for camera. Welcome home. It's been a while since I've made an appearance in the Budget Eats. It has. Which one, <laughs> sandwich or salad? Uh. I want the sandwich more because that bread looks amazingly toasted. All right. Which means I'm gonna have the salad first. Okay, hold on. So I introduced you this trash pasta salad. 
Yes, with... I can tell Ritz when I see it with... with MSG. Kind of correct. Okay. What? It has ranch seasoning. Ranch seasoning. I don't even know what that is. That's mm. what this is. Ooh. You like it? Yeah, but it's so fun. It's like a word that's even more fun than, than fun. It's a nonsense fun word, like funzabab. Do you like pasta salads usually? Yes. I like pasta salads usually, but I like this one especially. Step aside to show the Fred. <laughs> there it is. Do you have a grave for me? Mmm, it's been so long since I've grave, but could eat. My grave for this is fun out of ten. He's useless. Hmm. Eight out of ten. Hmm. It's I like the original take on a BLT. I love the bread. It's delicious. I know mm -hmm. you didn't bake it yourself. I just no. like hollow. But you toasted it well. Yes. It just needs something jazzier. So like hot sauce? Jazz. Not hot sauce necessarily. Just like something salty or spicy or fragrant or sour. Condiments like, that we don't have. Yes. Oh. All right. Show the folks who are not on the budget what you would like to put on your sandwich. Oh boy. That's really pungent. Very exciting. This is not for the faint of heart. This is fermented tofu, and it is quite stinky. One might say it is a very ripe brie, but I'm excited. Does it smell like Fred? Uh, what? <laughs> Smells like farts, but we love it. It's extra salty, extra creamy, and extra flavorful. How is oh, it? Oh yeah. Mm-hmm. You like it? Now that's a 10. It's one of the best BLTs I've had now. Not too shabby of a day one. I'm gonna baby this corn stalk and I'll see you guys tomorrow. Good morning and welcome back to day two. First things first, we're gonna boil off our pinto beans. We're gonna drain them from the soaking liquid, rinse them really quickly, put them in a pot of water about an inch, inch and a half above the surface of the beans. I think I'm gonna flavor it with some corn cobs that we made stock out of yesterday, as well as some celery leaves that we have. And just let it simmer with a lid slightly ajar for about 10 minutes. If you have the time to do so, I recommend skimming off some of that foam. It's just not delicious when it's cooked. Then we're gonna clamp the lid on shut tight, turn off the heat, and let it sit for half an hour. The carryover heat in that half hour should cook the beans to a mushy, creamy consistency, and if not, you can blast the heat back up for another five to 10 to finish it off. All right, let's taste those beans, shall we? Nicely mushy on the inside, cooked all the way through, not completely falling apart. They're not yet salted, so the flavor isn't too punchy at all. Pretty basic. We're gonna fish out the corn cobs and the leaves. They've given all they've got. And we're just gonna let the beans stay in the pot and cool down in there. They'll start to cook a little bit more, get a little bit creamier, which is all good news for us. As the beans are cooking, I think we gotta do something with these bananas. They're just not getting any younger. What is life without desserts? I don't know, and I don't wanna live it, so let's make some banana pudding with Ritz crackers. Haven't really thought this all the way through, but I'm thinking like a peanut butter and jelly situation with the bananas and the Ritz. Now, obviously we don't have a pudding mix here, so we can't actually make banana pudding, but we could just layer together some sort of a Ritz banana PB and J situation and slap it in the fridge, wait for it to kind of all melt together. And hopefully we will like eating it. In addition, I was eyeing these blueberries, and to be honest, they don't look that great. So I think we're gonna have to do something with them right now. To help us in our search for moisture in this not pudding, banana pudding, we're gonna cook down our blueberries and make a little sort of compote jam situation. We're going to rinse them, shake them dry, put them in a small pot, and put that pot over a medium low heat, stir it every now and then, and wait for them to burst with juices. What I can do to give it a little bit more moisture is to make a peanut butter sauce with our leftover pasta water. I think we're gonna need a little corn stalk to make this looser. There we go. Nice, smooth, and drizzleable. After about 10 minutes of bursting simmering, I think our sauce is pretty good. The fruit is still intact, half, 
and the syrup is getting nice and thick and shiny. We'll let this cool and then we'll layer it on. And maybe dilute our strawberry jam with a little bit of evaporated milk so that we have a little bit more liquid going on in there. Our banana pudding monstrosity is born. I'm gonna slip it into the fridge. We'll let it rest, probably overnight. We'll see if I get hungry enough. Call me crazy, but next up, we're gonna make some cornflake tamales. It's gonna be a mess, but come on, you live for it. Don't even try to deny it. First, we're gonna slightly char some of our leftover corn leaves. Besides making an absolute mess on your stove top, this will give us a little extra flavor to play with. Then we're gonna take some cornflakes, crush them, Ritz, crush them, put them in a pot, and go in with some seasonings. I'm thinking some of our mysterious taco seasoning packet alongside a little bit of our adobo sauce. Then we're gonna go in with some corn stalk, a little bit of peanut oil, maybe some black pepper, and we're just gonna hope that it forms a dough of some sort. While our dough cools off, let's make our cheese sauce. We're just going to combine some of our cheese powder with some of our ranch powder with evaporated milk. And because this is pure flavor concentrate with a ton of salt, we're gonna mash some of our pinto beans in there. I'm going to chop up our pieces of celery leaf with a scissor, just so that we don't get stringy bits. Abort mission, we are transferring to a bigger bowl. <laughs> there we go, much better. Mmm, tastes like cheesy refried beans. For a little bit of sweetness, I'm also gonna add in a little bit of our corn. Now, because I lack both the time and the skill to make actual tamales, what I'm gonna do is make a tamale pie. I'm going to cover the bottom of our plate, microwave safe, with our grilled leaves. I'm going to pick our skinnier leaves to lay down first, and then I'm gonna reserve the wider leaves to go on top so that we have a more even layer of leaves. I'm going to slather on top our dough masa of sorts. I'm going to spread that with our bean filling, top it with the remaining masa, and then we're gonna cover it with the remaining corn leaves. I'm also gonna be using these cabbage leaves that were on the outside of the entire head of cabbage. So it doesn't have the world's greatest seal on a tamale, and of course it's not really a tamale, but we're just gonna microwave it. Four to five minutes, see what happens. After four minutes, I gave it a prod. The dough didn't even seem boiling hot yet, so I just left it in there and set it for three and a half minutes more. At about two minutes into our second cook, I can start to smell the corn, the leaves, the cheesy fast foody addiction. It's a good sign. The cabbage leaves are starting to get toasty. The dough is very hot but I think we can go a little bit longer. Let's go for a full 10 minutes. Before we do our tamale review, I think we gotta feed Freddo. Ready for mush, Fred? One, two. Smells pretty good, guys. The smells like fried chicken almost. It is quite strange. It almost looks like a fried chicken exterior too. Not sure what's going on, but you know what? I'm hungry and I'm ready to taste. I think I need to get a little more of the bean filling, but that first bite is really good. I shouldn't be surprised that it smells so good in that fast food way, given that we have Ritz, cornflakes, cheese powder, ranch powder in here, but man, it smells good. And you can definitely taste the corniness coming through. It almost tastes like a semi maize masa. 
I love this so much. I am delighted by this. Would a little more condiment on this hurt it? Absolutely not. But do we have it? Not really. And do I miss it? Not really. I think it's quite wonderful on its own. Is it worth the work? Yeah. It's not a very streamlined recipe, but for the results, I would do this again. It also made a lot of food. I would say this is enough to feed four, probably, but maybe just two if you're super hungry. Look at those layers. Look at that beauty, that lumpy beauty. I think it's time to go ask if Simon Meow likes it. Simon, what do you think? <gasps> you don't like it? Why, Fred? It's so delicious. You know what? Fred can go suck it, because I give this one a nine. The balance of sweet, savory, salty, spicy, combined with that MSG in our powders just makes this a complete meal for me. All right, I think for dish number five, we're gonna attempt a yellow squash tinga, a play off of chicken tinga, often served as tacos. Obviously, we don't have tortillas today, so we will be serving them atop Ritz crackers. I'm gonna start by making a pinto bean mash. In a bowl, some pinto beans, a little bit of ranch seasoning, olive juice, a little bit of our beef gravy, and we're just gonna go until it's nice and smooth and spreadable. And then into a large pot over medium heat, we're gonna go in with some chiles in adobo chopped, tomato soup, a little bit of taco seasoning. We're gonna slice up one yellow zucchini or yellow squash, I guess. What's the difference? Beats me. Half of our tomato, some corn, a little bit of chopped green onions, some celery leaves, we're gonna dilute it down with corn stock so that we can let that squash cook all the way through until tender. Once the squash releases all of its moisture, we're gonna blast the heat up to high and keep cooking until that liquid is thickened. And then we're gonna season with a little bit of black pepper. We're gonna turn off the heat, we're gonna let it cool in its pot, and then once it is cool enough to eat, we're gonna assemble. I will just say that after tasting it, it seems like it's a little in need of fat, richness, delight of life. Now, of course, we do have this peanut oil that remains, but we still have more of peanut butter. So just in case we need this, I think we're gonna go ahead and use some peanut butter in here. Let's say a heaping tablespoon. Truly much better. You can't really taste the peanut butter in there, but it does taste a lot more well-rounded and it has a silkier texture now too. Let's assemble. I think these smell enticing, but I can't be sure. Look at the scallion placement on this one. That's some architecture right there. That was a pretty good bite. I'm kind of convinced that you can't do anything bad with Ritz crackers. The acidity that's in the tomato sauce is very, very mild. There's a lot of high fructose corn syrup in there and it comes off as a very friendly, friendly taste. I'm a super big fan of this, I think. It's not mind blowing, but it turned out way better than I thought it would. We're really hitting that sweet, savory combo today. Let's go see what Fred thinks. Seriously? Fred, hey. Well, okay then. Who needs words when you have a cat? I think I'm gonna give this a 7.8. Taste-wise, it passes, it's savory, it's nice texturally, it's intriguing but gentle. And for the most part, it's filling me up. I'm gonna do some dishes and then dessert. Y'all ready for this? <sighs> the, the banana taste. Ooh, if you didn't smell the banana before, you certainly smell it now. Check out all of that marbling. I don't know what you think, but I think this is absolutely gorgeous. You can see that the Ritz has fallen apart from the moisture. It's like soft and cakey now. 
If you like a sweet, you're really gonna like this one. The peanut butter is there, the jam is there, the Ritz, soggy, buttery, the banana, creamy, smooth. The blueberry provides a very unprocessed feel to this whole thing because you still get that little fibrous exterior of the blueberry itself. Otherwise, this just reads like a pretty sweet American dessert to me. My guess is this is gonna be even better tomorrow. It's time for the fret test. What do you think? No? Tell me how you really feel. Wow. Can't say I was surprised because cats can't taste sweetness and he's never really shown a love for peanut butter the way I have. All in all, I think this is a success of a dessert given what we got to work with. I'm gonna give this one a solid eight. Fans of PBNJ, this is your dream come true. Ritz banana pudding. All in all, I think we had a pretty good day. I also just realized that we've had Ritz for every single dish today. Maybe tomorrow can be cornflakes time to shine. Good morning and welcome to another beautiful day. I realized last night that there's been one ingredient I've been kind of putting off using and that's the cabbage. Yes, of course, we used the outer leaves to cover our tamale pie yesterday, but for the most part, cabbage can be a little uninspiring. However, I think we can make something super weird and fantastic with this. I think we can make some pinto stuffed cabbage rolls with this. For meal six, we're gonna microwave our washed cabbage until the leaves peel off whole. Some people prefer to put it into a pot of boiling water and peel the leaves off. That works, I just, uh, don't feel like boiling a whole pot of water in the middle of summer. For the cabbage, I like to trim off the bottom of that stem root end. This way the leaves peel off more readily. And then I like to give it a very thorough rinse. I really recommend heating up your cabbage so that the leaves are more pliable. Otherwise, once you start peeling them, they'll start breaking, which won't make for a very good roll. I like to put it on a plate to catch any moisture that might emerge and then I'm just gonna slide it in there and go at 30 second increments. After each round, check to see if it's ready to be peeled and if it's still too tight, put it back in for more time. You are in essence par cooking this cabbage right now so you're just waiting for that outer layer to steam pliably. In the beginning stages, it may take up to two to three minutes for that first layer to peel off, but once that entire head of cabbage is warmed all the way through, it'll become much easier. You waiting for cabbage? Yeah. Cabbage boy. Because the bottom of your plate will be much hotter in the microwave, I recommend that you flip that head of cabbage every now and then to ensure that the entire head is getting warmed up. As the cabbage cooks, you'll start to see it turn a vibrant green. As you get further into the head, just make sure you keep slicing that bottom off for an easy detach. When peeling, try to go around the sides of the cabbage and just slowly work your way in. If it starts ripping, move to a different spot and just try to use that solid stem to help you weasel your way under that leaf and peel it off. Once you have enough leaves, I like to stack them, put them back in the microwave and just microwave them until they're nice and soft to your desired consistency for that best wrap pliability. Meanwhile, we can make our bean mash. I'm thinking a little taco seasoning with our pinto beans, as well as some peanut butter. Your beans obviously don't have to be mashed smooth, a little texture is fine. Just be sure to mash them with the spices and the peanut butter before anything else goes in, otherwise you'll have a weird, weird texture. Some minced black olives, some corn, some diced celery, and some diced spam. Plus some thinly sliced scallions for that added flavor. I mean, not to say that this texture isn't weird. It, it's gonna be weird anyway, guys. Your cabbage leaves, when they come out, should be fairly translucent and looks a little bit like iceberg. To make sure that your cabbage rolls are as tender as they can be, trim off this root stem end that can be a little bit tougher. You can either munch on them as a healthy snack or incorporate them back into your mix. Mm. 
I think these would be great pickled if I had any vinegar. To make your cabbage rolls, you're gonna tuck and fold like you would a burrito. Take your leaf of cabbage, start with the rounded uncut end, put on a heaping, heaping tablespoon of filling, spread it out into a log shape, and then start rolling. As you roll that first revolution, tuck in the sides and then keep going until that log is completed. Place it into your microwave safe dish in a circle, however you want, seam side down. We're going to hit it with some of our beef gravy straight on top, and then we're gonna add some black pepper as well as green onions. We're gonna slide this baby into the microwave and go until I can smell everything cooking. At about 10 minutes in, you can really start to smell that gravy cook in. I think we're on the right path. I'm gonna go for two more minutes for a total of 12. I'm gonna pretend that we're at an overpriced fancy restaurant and I'm gonna swoosh a little bit of our tomato soup concentrate. This smells pretty good guys, and uh, it looks really beautiful inside actually. If you close your eyes and pretend that this is actually a fried wonton wrapper, this could uh, pass as an egg roll of sorts, maybe. Use your imagination. Mmm, this is giving me like massive comfort food, homemade with a Mexican tinge of flavor to it. The combination of the pinto beans and the tomato sauce kind of gives me like a little salsa vibe. But then you have the celery, which makes it taste like mom's cooking very comforting, relatively healthy, soothing flavors. And then you have a wallop of tiny bits of black olives. So again, it is kind of all over the place, but delicious. I would say don't skip on the tomato element. If you don't have tomato soup, you can probably get away with a little bit of ketchup thinned out with water. What do you think, chef? Okay, well, Fred wasn't a fan. It's very veggie forward. I guess it kind of just clouded that smell and taste of delicious Spam. You're lost, Fred. I'm also kind of surprised that he didn't seem attracted by the beef gravy at all, which, I don't know. Who knows what cats like? I think the seasoning is perfect. I think the cabbage is perfectly tender as well. It's not soggy at all. There's no liquid pooling on the bottom of our baking dish. It also makes a lot of food. We have 12 rolls here. So I'm gonna give this dish an 8.4. I think it's comforting, I think it's balanced, and I think it's relatively easy to do, and you can literally stuff cabbage rolls with whatever you want. We had savory, so now we must have sweet. Next up, corny French toast. Our bread is starting to go stale, so I think it's time we gotta use it up. Now, French toast is often soaked in a mixture of milk, cream, eggs, lots of liquid and flavoring. We only have this one can of evaporated milk to use, and I'd like to save some of it for another recipe as well. So we gotta think up of ways to make this French toast a little more exciting. For our French toast soak, since we don't have sugar, we're gonna have to use some of this jam. And just because traditional French toast is overwhelmingly sweet doesn't mean that this one has to be. What we lack in ingredients, we shall make up in weirdness. I think we're gonna have cornflakes stuffed French toast, if you don't mind. For our mixture, I'm gonna crush up some cornflake, a little bit of Ritz, a little bit of peanut butter to bind it all together, and a little bit of actual fresh corn. How does it taste? Well... Kinda good! You know what? Just to freak you guys out a little bit more, some black pepper. Crazy enough for you yet? For our soak, we're just gonna pour in some evaporated milk and then we're gonna stir in some strawberry jam until those two are combined. We're also gonna make a peanut butter drizzle, just watered down a little bit with corn stock, of course, so that we can have three types of corn in this recipe. We're gonna slice our bread fairly thick and then we're gonna cut a little slit in the middle of each slice so that we can stuff in our mixture. We're going to gently stuff that strange mixture into our bread and then we're going to batter it with that soak. Very lightly because there's not a lot to go around. 
and then into a heated skillet over medium heat with a touch of peanut oil. I told you it was gonna come in handy. One thing I will note here is that please use enough oil when you are frying something wet like French toast because if you don't, you'll end up with a very burned bottom. I used a little more oil in my second round and glad to say it came out way better. So some of the crunchy cornflake filling definitely fell out when I was soaking it and when I was cooking it, but you know what? It just got nice and toasty in the pan and now it's like crunchy topping. The gifts I give myself could not have foreseen this genius. It's not sweet sweet the way a lot of French toasts are, but it is still sweet enough where I have to chug some water right now. Blueberry and corn are one of my favorite combos and add in peanut butter into this equation, you know I can't possibly be happier than I am right now. There is so much grungy fun in here. Soft juicy crunch from the corn popping, the flaky soft crunch of Ritz crackers, the hearty crunch of corn flakes, the bread is soft but textured verily, verily. Yes, am I speaking Shakespearean? Yes, does this French toast deserve it? All that and more, babe. Is it a mess to eat and to make? Indeed. Is it worth it? I mean, guys, I just, I love it. I love me a good mess. Now, I do believe berries are not safe for cats, so obviously, as with all foods, I'm not gonna be feeding Fred this, but I do wanna see what reaction he will give. Fred. I need your opinion. What do you think? What? Speak. Interest. You have interest? You like it? You think it's worthy of an experiment? Honestly, I think Fred gave me a not for me, bro, but nice try. I like the way you think. So, with that in mind, I will give this 8.3. That feels right. All right, for meal number eight, we have this leftover French toast soak. We gotta do something with this. Wouldn't wanna waste all that good, good evaporated milk and corny flavors now, would we? I'm also thinking it's time to put this loaf of challah to rest. Red pudding, anyone? Now, naturally, I know you're thinking, June, those bananas look super ripe. I bet you're gonna make some banana bread pudding. Wrong, I say, because we already made banana pudding and it was made with Ritz and we're not gonna do that again. They're also throwing metal rods outside my building right now, so I feel particularly crazy, which is why I'm gonna be doing a pineapple spam bread pudding. It's gonna be sweet. It's gonna be salty. It's gonna be spicy. It's gonna be plushy and it's gonna be crunchy. And there will be lots of green onions in there. Zach, can we enter like a like a evil scientist laughter here? <laughs> Thank you. Maybe like a like a bolt of lightning too. <laughs> You're the best. <laughs> Given that we're not baking anything except in the microwave, I don't really see a point in searing off anything. We don't really have any oil to add flavor, so I'm just gonna chop up everything, layer it into our pie dish, and we're gonna microwave it. Easy breezy, you asked for it. What I am going to do is to cube our bread into one inch cubes and then we're gonna toss it in our leftover soak first. This will ensure that all of the dried bits of bread will at least have some moisture coating them before we microwave it. I'm gonna dice up our Spam, toss it in there along with some corn and we're gonna drain our pineapple and reserve the juice for another use. Now, because there isn't really quite enough liquid in this bread pudding, I think we're gonna have to make a dressing of sorts to add to the liquid here. I'm gonna be combining these two with a little bit more of evaporated milk and pouring it over top. And for a little bit of sweet tartness, we're gonna add in some of that pineapple juice back. Alrighty. Let's cook. 
Now, I know I promise you crunchy, and don't worry, I didn't forget, we shall have crunchy. Just like how we used up our Ritz crackers earlier, I'm gonna be tossing some of our corn flakes with our ranch seasoning powder. Gotta get that MSG in somehow, you know? Stingy. Smells like school cafeteria. Now, unfortunately, we're gonna have to miss out on the best part of bread pudding, which are the crunchy edges, because no oven, no crispiness. I mean, let's be honest, shall we? It's not the most appetizing thing I've ever made. It's, uh, soggy, wet, everything looks a little bit like flesh. It's just, a. Uh, You know what they say though, looks can be deceiving. That first bite of challah that I got, amazing. It's so nice and rich with the sauce that's slightly spicy and slightly tomato-y. Mmm. Ooh. Juicy pineapple, soggy bread, crunchy ranch cornflakes. What a flavor combo, guys. Do I love it? Kinda. The parts of the bread that wasn't completely sogged through by the soak got a little rubbery in the microwave because it gets dehydrated but not toasty, so it's just kind of like... You've, you've microwaved bread before, you know what it tastes like. If you're not a fan of Hawaiian pizza flavor combos, you will hate this. However, if you love it, I think you might love this. The saltiness of the Spam, plus the sweetness of the pineapple, plus that lush hala soaked bread, and corn, and scallions. I love it. But what do I know? Let's go ask the pro here. I know it doesn't look like much, but what do you think? Y you okay, buddy? W worth another smell? <gasps> Whoa, you went for a bite! <gasps> Wow, that good, huh? You smelled the spam, didn't you? You did. Well, I'm happy to report that Fred loves it, therefore I think this deserves quite a nice grade. I'm gonna give this one an 8.5. I think if we could have somehow baked this in the oven, it would easily bring it to a nine. For our final dish today, I think we're gonna make a little cabbage slaw. Need a little more veggie after the last two dishes, so I'm thinking sliced cabbage, cubed mango, and a little pineapple sauce. Also think we can add some more corn in there, you know, for that little sweet, sweet pop. I'm going to trim that mango around the seed and use about half of it. I'm going to score that half of mango into tiny little cubes and then use a spoon to scoop it out. I'm going to have our remaining cabbage shredded really thin, For our dressing, I'm gonna take our last mayo packet plus a couple of these Tabasco bottles and we're gonna mix it with some black pepper and pineapple juice. I put a little bit of green onions on top for both texture and flavor and color. Let's take a taste, shall we? I think for sure I love the mangoes in there. Nice, juicy, little tender bite of fruit that adds a little creaminess as well as sweetness. I just wish there were more of corn, mayo, and mango in here. I also don't think my mango is super ripe, so it's not really giving off as much fragrance as I had anticipated. What is that face, Fred? Are you interested? <gasps> Are you interested? <gasps> Maybe. <gasps> Ooh, you're licking your lips. Does that mean you like it? While Fred seemed to like this, or at least be intrigued by it, I'm not really loving it. I think I just wanted to have a little more meatiness and flavor. I think I wanted to have a little MSG. <sighs> Shall we? Y'all ready for this? Ranch powder 
is exactly what this needed. That is so good. I was all ready to give this bad boy like a 5.5 or a 6, but now, now it's a 7.6. The ranch powder makes the mayo taste mayoier. it makes the Tabasco smoother, and it makes the cabbage and mango saltier. All of that to say, a little bit of seasoning takes you a long way. I'll see you tomorrow. Good morning and welcome to day four. Today we shall eat some pasta and we shall cook some of those bananas because they are getting ripe. It's getting to that stage where if you poke them a little, you can start to feel that sugar inside melting, which means they're perfect for banana bread. Now, how do we make banana bread without flour? Well, we gotta try with cornflakes, I guess. First things first, we're gonna take this bag of cornflakes and we're gonna crush it real fine, as fine as we can get it just with our hands. So we have about four cups in here and we're gonna mash half that amount of mashed bananas. Then I'm gonna throw some strawberry jam into that mix just for a little added bump of sweetness. I've definitely tasted worse things. We're going to drizzle a little bit of our peanut oil into the container so that it doesn't stick, and then we'll put the rest in here. Then we'll transfer it into our loaf pan and just let it sit while we prep our pasta. For our first pasta today, it's gonna be a cabbage cream pasta. We're gonna boil some of our half pound of open bagged pasta in a combination of corn stalk, bean liquid, olive juice, and a tiny touch of evaporated milk. Wow, surprisingly, not expired. Pull your pasta when it's still al dente with a little bit of white in the center if you like a little bit of chew in your final product. If you like it mushy, just keep cooking it. The choice is yours. Now that we have our nice starchy water, we can just start cooking our veggies as we prep them. For the cabbage and the celery leaves, I like to chop them really, really, really fine. That way they can really melt into that sauce. And for the squash, I'm leaving out the outer skin of it because that part doesn't really break down into a creamy tenderness. Instead, what I'll do is wash it, have it, score it, and then try to scoop out all of the scored innards without disturbing the outside hull because we'll be using this for something else. We're also going to add in some white parts of scallions. Our veggie mixture definitely needs a little help in the seasoning department, so we're gonna go in with our cheese powder, as well as some black pepper. We also still have our yellow mustard packets, which has vinegar, mustard seeds, salt, sugar, turmeric, paprika, cloves, cinnamon, allspice, and coriander, and I feel like this is gonna be a great addition. And for a little MSG action, we're gonna go in with our ranch powder. When your cabbage mixture starts to develop a golden brown fond on the bottom of the pot, that's when you know you're ready. That sauce should be clinging to every crevice of that cabbage mixture and the cabbage should be completely softened. For our pasta, I think I'm gonna toss it in a little bit of our tomato soup. Time to eat. We're gonna sprinkle it with a little bit of corn and scallions. And of course, if you want a bit more texture, some ranch ritz. Smells like tomato soup. All right. Oh man, what I would do for some Parmesan on top of this right now. 
but you gotta make do with what you do have. Obviously, Parm is amazing for a lot of reasons, but one of the reasons is it's very high in MSG, so because we don't have it, we just gotta go heavy with our ranch Ritz. I'm really glad we decided to put the corn in there because the cabbage is a little bit acidic, especially with that sweet tomato soup pasta. So the corn is really bringing out the sweetness to tame that acidity. The cabbage is completely tender. You barely need to chew it at all. Almost reminiscent of a more friendly sauerkraut. The pasta is still al dente, but it's no longer raw in the middle. The entire pasta is cooked all the way through now. And I'm really glad that we have both the tomato-y pasta as well as the mustardy cabbage because I think they go together super well. I think the cabbage on its own is a five at best, but then you throw in the tomato-y pasta and the MSG-laden Ritz, the sweet corn, and the spicy fresh scallions, it's got to be like a 7.2. Fred, do you want to judge? Do you want to judge, Fred? What do you think, bud? Will you give it a sniff? What say you? I do wish you spoke English. That would be awesome. We could communicate, talk about your dreams, your criticisms of me. I, I don't think you like this, huh? As predicted, Fred is not a fan. It is very veggie forward. Fred, would you like some seasonings in your food too? Seasoning. Good for everyone. Hmm? Like it? Do you like it? Yeah. 10 out of 10. Hot tip, you can crush up some treats and treat it as a seasoning powder for your pet's food. Fred seems to like it. Dishes are done and I gotta be honest with you, this diet is making me very very sleepy. A lot of carbs. A lot of simple carbs. <laughs> Here is our mushy banana cornflake strawberry jam mixture. I haven't even microwaved this yet, but it's so set. I'm really curious what it tastes like right now. I guess it is kind of like uh, cornflake bread pudding. Hmm. Wow. That's pretty good. This can be a, a no-bake banana bread. I think not warming it up makes the banana flavor less intense, which makes me like it more. I think the only thing this needs is a peanut butter drizzle. The peanut butter at the bottom of our jar is really solidified, and especially because we drained away the oil, it's very, very thick. As we've done previously, I'm just gonna take a little bit of peanut butter, mix it with a little bit of room temperature water until it's nice and drizzleable, and then we can dress our cake. To add a little bit of freshness to our plate, I'm going to slice up some of our remaining mango and then serve alongside the cake. Okay, a three ingredient cake, quote unquote. Not too shabby looking. It's holding its shape quite well on the fork. Peanut butter drizzle looks luscious as always. Who knew? Water and peanut butter. Mmm. I could eat this for breakfast. <laughs> it is nice and moist, just like the best banana cakes, except it's got a little bit of a looser structure. The flavors are all there. Pretty pure. As far as processed foods go, the ingredients list on cornflakes not too bad. Milled corn, sugar, malt flavor, 2% or less of salt, and then BHT as a preservative, which translates into this cake not tasting as cafeteria processed food as the other items we've made. Serve it with a little extra peanut sauce, a little more corn flakes. Man oh man, is this enjoyable. I honestly don't even know if I needed the mango, but it's here. And it's good. The mango adds a nice fruity acidity and it also helps the cake not like cling to your throat as it travels its way down your esophagus. It gives it a nice little juicy lubricant. Fred? Fred? Oh, well, hi buddy. Can you give me a tasting? Do you, do you want me to leave you alone? I guess you don't like bananas or peanut butter or corn. Okay, thank you. Well, Fred's not a fan, but I like it. I think I'm gonna give this one an eight. I don't know if that's inflated, but 
based on how easy this is, I, it's mind-blowing. I bet if we could have used our Vitamix, we would have gotten really similar to a banana bread texture. And that's not to say that we didn't achieve a banana bread texture here. I think we did great. Oh my god, I am in serious need of vegetables. <laughs> so about that yellow squash boat that we made earlier, let's do something with them now. I'm kind of imagining a uh, modern day take on ants on a log. This will be ants on a yellow log. Instead of filling that log with peanut butter, we will be filling it with a mashed bean concoction that has peanut butter flavoring in it. To really pump up the flavor, we'll be adding some of this adobo sauce. Mash your beans and your peanut butter and your adobo until it's all nice and smooth. Give it a taste. I like the slight hint of spiciness from the adobo, but I wish there was more acid in here. I think I'm gonna go in with a little bit of black pepper and a little bit of ketchup. Not only are we getting some MSG from the tomatoes, we are also gonna get a little bit of vinegar. Almost reminds me of meatloaf. And to really pump up that fiber and nutrition and crisp, we'll be adding some celery chopped. And our ants this time will actually be black. A little bit of green onions on top and a little dash of taco seasoning to top it all off. These are the most abundant ants on a log I've ever seen chunky boys. Now, for people who hate black olives, you would probably hate this. That's okay. This isn't for you. I'm gonna go ahead and chop this in half so you can see what's inside. Could almost pass as a uh, tuna salad. And it also gives me some Bloody Mary vibes with, you know, the ketchup tomato element and the celery element. Obviously, you know, vodka in here, but imagine that. The olives are surprisingly not as salty as I expected, so a little more taco seasoning on top. I think out of all the things that I've made so far, this one would taste probably closest to what you would imagine it tasting. What you see is what you get. Mashy, mildly spiced beans with crunchy celery and a crisp, tender little zucchini shell with spices on top. Olives, can't really taste them. The ketchup really rounds out a sweetness in the beans, but I would say the key player in here is the taco seasoning. It really finishes off that taste flavor profile at the very end perfectly. Fred seemed very, very tired, so I won't be bothering him, but for this dish, I give it a solid 6.9. For our final meal today, we will be cooking another pasta dish. This time, it's gonna be cooked in some beef broth. We're also gonna pop in that pasta water, some ketchup, and our tomato, as well as an ancho chili and our olive juice. We're gonna be adding enough water just to cover that pasta, and we're going to boil it until it's al dente. Like we previously did, we're gonna fish out our pasta and we're gonna keep that flavorful broth in the pot to which we will add some chopped cucumbers and chopped celery. I'll pop in a couple of chopped olives as well for a little bit of fattiness and flavor. For a little bit of added richness, we're gonna plop in some peanut butter as well just to give it that nuttiness and fattiness and we'll season it with a little bit of taco seasoning and black pepper as well. Once your sauce is thickened and clings to your veggies, you are there. I present to you trash bastardized ratatouille. Very exciting, I can smell the taco seasoning just wafting off of every single bite. The pasta, nice, tomato-y. The veggies, thickened, creamy sauce enveloping each and every crunchy bite. I don't know how to describe it quite because there's just not enough salt in here to make it addictive, but it is super comforting. The textures, the warmth, 
the little juicy fleshy bites of olives. I know it doesn't look like much, but I am enjoying this way more than I thought I would for such a trashy, trashy concoction. Not bad. As a kid, my mom used to stir fry cucumbers and I used to hate them. But here, covered in a peanutty taco seasoning sauce, it's actually really nice. Once cooked, cucumbers take on this super silky tender bite. I don't quite know how to describe it except sturdy or zucchini. Fred? Fred, are you alive? What do you think, Fred? Last judge of the day. Is it okay or no? Why do you always yawn? Is it because you're bored? Well, Fred didn't seem too enthused, but the beef gravy wasn't very beefy, so I get it. I'm gonna go ahead and give this dish an 8.1. I think as far as comfort food goes, this is pretty good, especially considering what we had to work with. I'm gonna call it a day here for today, and I'll see you tomorrow for our final day of meals. Wish us all luck. Hello and welcome to day five, our final day and our final ingredients. Let's take a look at what we have left. On the spice front, we have some black pepper, some peppers, all of our powdered seasonings and our very, very expired Tabasco sauces. On the fruit front, we have some pineapple chunks as well as juice. We also have that middle seedy part of the mango and our three peaches, which are now very withered. We have a little bit of peanut butter left and some strawberry jam. We have about a half cup of evaporated milk along with one cup of cornflakes and one sleeve of Ritz crackers. Finally, on the veggie front, we have green scallions, white parts of the scallions, one cucumber, and some celery. How many meals can we eke out of these last standing soldiers? I'm not sure, but let's get started anyway. There's nothing to it but to do it. Gotta be honest with you, I went back for second helpings of the pasta last night and I am pretty stuffed, so let's start with a light snack. How does a uh, spicy cucumber salsa served on top of Ritz crackers sound to you? JK, this is not a democracy, we're gonna do it anyway. Because the skin on this cucumber is quite tough, I'm not sure it'll be appetizing eaten raw, so I think what we're gonna do is to peel it off. Maybe we can dehydrate it into a chip? For our cucumbers, I put them on a microsafe plate, I put them in the microwave for about two to three minutes until they get blistery and dried out like this. You guys, look at the pretty little beads on this cucumber. Then we're going to take about a third of it and we're gonna chop it real fine. We're gonna chop our pineapples real fine to add a little more fruitiness, heft, and flavor to our salsa. I'm also going to be dicing up the rest of this mango. For the mango, I like to use a vegetable peeler and just peel off the outside rind. Then I trim around the seeds to get all the flesh I can out of it. Does anyone else think the seed of the mango is the best part to gnaw on? Especially when you get those little fibers stuck in your teeth and you get so annoyed with yourself. And we're gonna mix that all together with some strawberry jam. We're gonna chop up one of our chipotle peppers real fine. It smells fresh, it smells sweet, fruity, and spicy. My first thought is, man, do I wish I had tortilla chips right now because while Ritz is delicious, the buttery flavor profile of the flakiness of it all just doesn't quite go with the salsa, but the salsa itself, absolutely delicious. Fresh, crunchy, tender, juicy, fruity. Unfortunately, the texture of the Ritz is such that it just kind of turns into mush meal in your mouth the moment it hits something wet like a salsa. It's delicious on its own, the salsa is delicious on its own, I just need a little more crunch to go with that salsa. So what if we gave it a little more crunch? You thinking what I'm thinking? Cornflakes, salsa. <laughs> oh my god, I love this. 
Oh man, if I close my eyes and just think that these are the broken chips from the bottom of the bag, I could make believe that these are tortilla chips. That's really hitting the spot. Listen, I love Ritz as much as the next person does. Look at all those flaky layers inside, but sometimes it just doesn't work. I think Ritz pairs better with creamier consistencies, jammier consistencies, but for really watery, moist consistencies like a salsa, go with corn chips, or better yet, corn flakes. You just really gotta have that crunch in there, you know? Today, we have redefined breakfast cereal eating. My job here is done. I'm gonna go ahead and give the salsa a 7.3. Next up, it's time for our veggies to shine. I think I'm gonna go ahead and make a veggie salad with a spicy peanut sauce. We're gonna treat the veggies a little differently to bring out the flavors and to soften them a little bit. As for our microwaved cucumber skins, well, they can be crushed and they can be turned into seasoning perhaps. I'm gonna crush it with just my fingers and then I'm gonna mix in a little bit of this black pepper and some taco seasoning. Who needs a dehydrator when you have a microwave? I think this will make for a beautiful garnish. As for the cucumbers, we're gonna slice them real thin and we're gonna dust them with a little bit of ranch seasoning which has salt in it which will draw some of the moisture and soften the cucumber slices. We'll just let the cucumbers sit and marinate in this ranch seasoning while we slice up and cook off our scallions and celery. Celery and scallions will be sliced thin and then microwaved until they just start to soften. Takes about two minutes in the microwave on high heat for the celery to get vibrantly green. Still crunchy, just a little bit soft. and the scallions take about 90 seconds or so. You want them slightly translucent. After about 10 minutes, you'll start to see water seeping from your cucumbers. That's a good sign, they're getting tender. For the spicy peanut sauce, we're gonna water the peanut sauce down with a little bit of our adobo sauce, as well as our Tabasco jars and literally water. Go ahead and stir your sauce until it is smooth, and if you need more water to thin it out, consider using the moisture that comes from your microwaved veggies. It has not only moisture, but also flavor. To assemble your salad, dump all of your veggies into a larger bowl, pour in your sauce, and give it a nice good mix. As always, give it a taste, see if you like it, and if you don't, season it some more. And if you still have any scallions left over, toss those on top too. If you want, top with your cucumber seasoning. I find it fascinating that the crushed cucumber peel not only looks like seaweed, but it also smells like seaweed, especially with that taco seasoning in it. Kind of like homemade togarashi of sorts. The first taste is celery with peanut. And I really truly wish that we had stronger peanut butter flavors in here, but because we were only working with the dredges of that jar, you know, there is a nice hint of spiciness that lights up across your tongue. You don't really taste the scallions, probably because the chipotle peppers are overpowering it. The texture is crisp, but also kind of silky tender which I love, and all in all, I think it just works. The spice will catch up to you though. Whew. It's one of those addictive levels of spiciness where if you stop eating it, you are in pain, therefore you keep eating it, just to delay that pain a little bit more. The goal here and for every spice lover out there is of course to find that pleasure in that pain. The cucumber salt is really nice. It adds an extra layer of umami, I think overall, I'm gonna give this dish a 7.8. I do have a feeling though that leftovers of the salad will have a stronger peanut flavor once it's chilled in the fridge. And now for our finale meal. I think it's gotta be dessert, right? Pineapple, strawberry, peach, dessert. For our pineapple juice, I'm thinking we can cook this down on the stove and reduce it to a syrup. 
We'll add a little bit of strawberry jam just to heighten that sugar content. We'll bring it up to a simmer over medium heat and just let it cook until it starts to thicken. In the meantime, we'll go ahead and cut our peaches into wedges. And then I'm going to stir together our remaining evaporated milk with our remaining strawberry jam to create a strawberries and cream sort of situation. We're going to pour some of our milk strawberry jam mixture over our cornflakes to rehydrate them a little bit. We're gonna place our sliced peaches in a microwave safe container and then we're gonna pour over our pineapple syrup and toss to coat. Once all of your peaches are fully coated in that pineapple syrup, go ahead and put your rehydrated cornflakes on top of that mixture. We're gonna pop this baby into the microwave and microwave it until the peaches are nice and tender. About five minutes in, you'll start to smell that milky cornflake mixture and your peaches should be a syrupy, syrupy perfection. I'm gonna recommend that you go ahead and let it cool off for about 10 minutes so that that syrup can solidify and gel up into a shiny little thick sauce. It smells buttery and almost butterscotchy. I think the butterscotch notes are definitely coming from that slightly burnt pineapple caramel, so pretty excited to dig into this. To serve, I'm gonna get a big scoop onto my bowl and then I'm gonna drizzle with a little bit more of our evaporated milk with that strawberry jam mixture and then top with crushed grits if you want it. I don't know about you, but I'm pretty pumped about this. The flaky Ritz, the juicy, tender, jelly-like peaches. Oh man, the rehydrated cornflakes. What a weird thing, huh? What a weird week, guys. <laughs> First of all, the peaches are perfect. They're jammy, they're sweet, they're nice and tender. They taste a little bit like dried apricots and they are still so super warm. The cornflakes have sort of bunched into this dumpling mixture and they're just little tiny dough balls at this point. You can taste the milkiness from the evaporated milk mixture, but I sometimes wonder if I probably should have crushed some of the Ritz into the cornmeal mixture to give it that butteriness from the Ritz. As is, this is not half bad especially when you pour over some more of that evaporated milk mixture. Luscious. I'm wondering how it would taste with our banana bread from yesterday. It was cornflake on cornflake action, you know? Okay, so if you grew up drinking that Tropicana mix of orange juice, banana, strawberry, peach, this tastes exactly like that but in a warm bread pudding feel. Truly makes me nostalgic for grade school days. Obviously this would taste a lot better with butter, maybe more sugar, but as is, I'm gonna give this one a 7.9. I think it's pretty decent. Did you have a fun week, Fred? Did you have a fun week? All in all, I think we had a pretty decent week. I really love the PLT that we made on day one. I was also really taken away by the cabbage rolls and the tamale pie. Loved both of those. I think my favorite dessert was probably our banana Ritz pudding, but the banana bread with cornflakes blew my mind away. The fact that you could make that with just three ingredients and no heat application whatsoever Pretty magical. I think personally, I would have loved to have some more fat somewhere. The fact that we didn't have any cooking oil to work with was a little bit hard for me, as well as, you know, all of the spices that I didn't have access to. But thankfully, we had a lot of condiments to work with and we had a lot of spice powders to work with, so we had some spice in our life. I hope you had fun joining me and Fred this week. If you have any brilliant recipes with any of the ingredients that I used this week that I didn't make, please drop a comment down below and let us know what your magical recipe is. I wanna give a big thank you to the folks at Food Share South Carolina and the folks at Hunger Free America. Love the work that you guys do and I hope more people will do more work like you. If y'all have any ideas of what we can cook up on the next Budget Eats, drop a comment down below and let us know what do you want to see next. Until next time, Fred and I tell you to take care and stay hydrated. See ya.